Good afternoon, Cougar Nation, and welcome to a new edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast on kslsports.com. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper. It's Monday, June 26, and here's the roadmap for today's show. Jan Jorgensen, the Janimal, he's hired and he's coming back to BYU as more staffers join the BYU football program. BYU adds a JUCO cornerback, the bowl game situation for BYU in 2022, plus BYU head football coach Kalani Satake on the program to preview the 2022 season. The Cougar Tracks podcast, as always, is streaming live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on KSL Sports social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. It's also available in podcast form on all major podcasting platforms and the KSL Sports app. You can follow me on Twitter at Mitch underscore Harper and follow KSL Sports on all social media platforms. So we'll start things off today on the podcast with the new staff additions for the 2022 season. The most notable one, this was announced on Friday, shortly after the Friday edition of the podcast came out. Jan Jorgensen, he joins the program as a defensive analyst. No introduction needed for the Janimal. Jan is an all-time great in BYU football history. I mean, one of the best. Great dude, great guy, great football player. Jan, what's crazy about him was that he was a Ron McBride guy. He was not a BYU through-and-through guy growing up. He was a Utah fan. Went to Kentucky to follow Ron McBride, but then he ends up being a true blue BYU Cougar, and now he's home. Provo is his home, and he's back. And adding Jan Jorgensen is an incredible addition to BYU, in my opinion. You're talking about a guy that had 30 sacks in his BYU career. And I know sacks are not the end-all, be-all in today's world of college football with these great passing attacks, but... There's still a place, there's still a significance behind getting a guy that can rack up sacks. And Elisa Tuiaki knows that too. Coming out of media day, Elisa Tuiaki was candid that he wants sacks just as much as anyone. They're not going to sacrifice something else in order to simply get sacks. Ideally, with Jan Jorgensen now being a defensive analyst in the BYU football program, to me... You put him on Tyler Batty and coach that man up. That's it. Tyler Batty, to me, gives BYU the best case to get back to an individual sack artist that's got 10-plus sacks in a year. He's the best bet right now. There's some guys in the pipeline, and I've talked about them in previous shows, that could potentially do that. But Batty's the one right now. And Jorgensen gives BYU a chance maybe to to teach some techniques, some tricks to help Batty uh, get to those heights. And I think what's also notable, too, is that simply being a Power 5 program is giving BYU the chance to hire some quality analysts. Here's your analyst for BYU football in 2022. Al Papunu, he was part of the staff last year, but officially on board as an analyst this year. Matt Mitchell comes from Baylor to BYU, back to BYU, who's part of the staff in 2020. Tyson McDaniel, who is working on the Arizona State staff. Vince Fayula, who's been part of BYU for a while now. Randy Coy as well. And Gavin Fowler, who's been part of the staff since his playing days concluded in 2018. That's quite an analyst group right there. A lot of interesting experience, and they are helping these coaches quite a bit. The offensive analysts are helping Aaron Roderick a ton. Aaron Roderick can't speak enough about what Matt Mitchell brings to the offensive staff along with Al Papunu. Tyson McDaniel is kind of a a quarterback whisperer guy. He was working a lot with the quarterbacks in spring practices. Uh, Same with Matt Mitchell, though. He's got a a good knowledge of the quarterback position. He's been involved in the recruitment of Ryder Burton. So these guys are valuable. And I think having Jan Jorgensen, someone who's worked with Kalani Satake staff before as a grad assistant, he's a BYU great. He brings a lot of value. And I think what it also says, too, is that you can get maybe some JUCO defensive coordinator, coordinator p- position, or head coach 
and bring them on as an analyst because you're P5 now. You've got more visibility. It's it's great for the resume to say you were an analyst or you are an analyst at a P5 school. That's a step up. It's not BYU, the alma mater, analyst there, independent. That doesn't look as great on the resume. I, I think this is very this is a good sign for BYU to get Jan Jorgensen back to BYU. Jorgensen most recently was a defensive coordinator at Snow College and before that, Orange Coast College as well. BYU also hired Patrick Hickman as the director of recruiting. He was previously at BYU as a director of football ops, high school relations, things like that. Worked under the Bronco Mendenhall regime. He was out there in Virginia. He now comes back to BYU. Christiana Roberts becomes the executive assistant to the head coach and Anna Lamb as the football office manager. Lamb and Roberts have been on the job for about a month or two from what I understand. Uh, but Hickman, he takes over beginning today, I believe, uh, as the director of recruiting. So the staff additions continue to improve for BYU as they ramp up for the Big 12 Conference. Another thing that's ramping up in efforts to get ready for life in the Power Five is the secondary. Man, General Guilford was not kidding around when he said cornerback was going to be a big focus after the December signing period. Since the calendar turned to 2022, BYU has added seven cornerbacks to the room. The latest addition is Maury Bamba, junior college transfer from Tyler JC in Texas. Six foot three, 190 pounds, and a ton of speed. You're talking about maybe a high four three guy, four four, freaky athlete. Track and field background, began his college career at a D school up in Wisconsin near his hometown. Dealt with some injuries his senior year of high school. Goes to football at Asa College in Miami. Then transfers to Tyler J.C. this past spring. And oh, by the way, in Tyler J.C., there's a BYU connection in Tanner Jacobson, who's worked closely with this defensive staff at BYU in Tanner Jacobson. So, Boy Bomba's a great get. I just think from you're looking at production, eh. I, there, there's not really a body of work to turn to that says he's the power five DB, but height, weight, speed, long athlete. Could he be a P five corner? That's going to be the challenge. And if you turn Chris Wilcox into an NFL DB, you've turned Malik Moore into a really good safety. Why not turn this guy into something special as well? There's a track record there. BYU is going to have to elevate themselves and try to get some higher profile defensive backs in the future. You can't always bank on these under the radar developmental guys to win in the big 12, but coach G general Guilford has done a great job in developing these guys and turning them into four star guys. Once they leave BYU, maybe five star. If you're, if you're an NFL draft pick, you're pretty much a five star guy. So I think it's a good addition. Maury Bamba, he's got three years of eligibility, and he joins the team this year. And it's not a coincidence that cornerback was a big focus when you had three medical retirements from last year's room. Keenan Ellis, Shimon Willis, and Isaiah Heron gone. Medical retirements. They are wiped out from the room, so you needed to bring in a wave of newcomers to supplement that upperclassman of D'Angelo Mandel and Caleb Hayes. Gabe Judy Lally from Vanderbilt comes in, and he's going to push those two starters. I'm expecting that to be a great competition coming up in fall camp. I think D'Lo Mandel and Hayes, they know the battle is going to be in front of them with Judy Lally. Ideally, I've said it all along, Jacob Robinson, he needs to go back to the nickel position. And I think if you add, with, with adding Mori Bamba, with adding Corbin Green, you're going to have players enough players at cornerback to put Jacob Robinson back at the nickel position in my, in my opinion. But I like Maury Bamba. I, I think this is a, a very interesting addition by BYU with tremendous upside. I still think the guy in 2022 that makes the biggest impact is Corbin Green from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Six foot two, kind of true cornerback like. His fastest 100 meters, 11, 11 flat as a sophomore, which is really good. He dealt with some injuries his senior year in high school at Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
He arrived on BYU's campus earlier this month. He's going to be really good. I think he's going to be a two deep guy from the jump because I just think he's got those natural skills. BYU is is leaning into a lot of the speed guys. Corbin Green's not the the lights out 10 4 100 meter like Evan Johnson from California, but Corbin Green's got great instincts. And I, that's what I like about him. And he's got attitude too. You want that from the cornerback position. I think Corbin Green's going to bring that. I'm curious though to see what Maury Bamba can do. Uh, that will be some fun competition in fall camp at the cornerback spot. Uh, before I get to our interview with Kalani Satake from BYU Football Media Day, I wanted to give an update on BYU's bowl game situation in 2022. And I bring this up because there's always confusion when it comes to what bowl game is BYU going to in a given season. This will not be a debate or a confusion point going forward into the Big 12 Conference. 2023, you're going to have the likes of the Sugar Bowl, the Alamo Bowl. You're going to have some great games that would be better than anything independence would offer in the Big 12 tie-ins. All the Big 12 Bowl tie-ins I found out, too, looking at them today, all against Power 5 teams. How nice will that be for BYU, where you don't have to worry about, oh, are you going to get matched up against some scrub conference USA team? I mean, that sounds harsh, but it just, a program like BYU deserves better in the postseason. And they've had a history, too, of building up these bowl games over the year. I mean, the Holiday Bowl, it's not what it is without BYU. The Las Vegas Bowl, it's not what it is without BYU. Literally, the Vegas Bowl was ready to shutter its doors until BYU stepped into the game in 2005. Nonetheless, the final year of independence is kind of lackluster once again when it comes to the Bulls. Tom Homo mentioned this at BYU Football Media Day that BYU is a bowl free agent. ESPN will slot them into one of BYU's, or excuse me, ESPN's owned bowl games. And those bowl games that are open, that don't have specific tie ins, include the following ESPN owns 16 FBS bowl games. But the games going into 2022 that have open bids, which means you could have a lot of different conferences, a lot of different independent teams potentially factor into these bowl games, include the following. New Mexico Bowl, Frisco Bowl, Myrtle Beach Bowl, Boca Raton Bowl, Hawaii Bowl, and the Gasparilla Bowl. Gasparilla Bowl, a little bit unlikely because there's Power 5 tie-ins involved with the ACC, Notre Dame, SEC, and the American from the G5 ranks. But New Mexico, Frisco, Myrtle Beach, Boca Raton, and Hawaii. Ugh. July 1st, 2023. Can't come soon enough. I know Kalani's focused on this year, and this team has a lot of potential to do some great things. But it's just so lackluster to think that this great BYU team, and I do think they can be great, is going to probably be slotted in one of those terrible bowl games. It is what it is. You got to put up with it. It's independence. But that's that's the situation for BYU. What about the New Year's Six? This is probably the worst year for the NY Six because the national semifinals are the Fiesta Bowl and the Peach Bowl. Typically, those are the bowl games that have a lot of the at-large spots. So the other bowl games, the Rose, the Sugar, the Orange, Cotton, they now pretty much have bowl tie-ins. Orange will be ACC versus Big Ten or SEC. Sugar will be SEC versus Big 12. Rose will be Big Ten versus Pac-12. And then the Cotton Bowl will be the top-ranked G5 versus an at-large. So there's one at-large bid available. And the problem is BYU will not get that spot. They have to go undefeated. If they want to get that spot, they have to go 12-0. 11-1 won't get it done, and here's why. They won't have a 13th data point. They won't play in a conference championship game. Plus, the playoff committee can always say, well, they only played five power fives. This team from, say, the SEC, the Big Ten, played nine power fives. There you go. BYU, run the table, and you probably have a great shot at going to the Cotton Bowl. Don't run the table. You're going to one of those bowl games from the ESPN pool, which is New Mexico, Frisco, Myrtle Beach, Boca Raton, and Hawaii. Best one out of that group, Hawaii Bowl. 
but it's not great from a date perspective because it's Christmas Eve and that's not ideal. But hey, I'm telling my bosses right now, I will go. I will sacrifice. I will go to the Hawaii Bowl. Just letting it be known, bosses. If you want to send me, I'll go to the Hawaii Bowl. Just, I'm okay. Maybe I might have to take my family too. That's okay. I'm just putting that, that out there into the universe. Work needs to flip the bill. It needs to be BYU coverage on the islands. I can do that. But that's the situation for BYU football on the bowl front. What do you think of BYU's bowl situation? You can share your comments on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you're watching. Big 12 affiliation can't come soon enough. Am I right? <laughs> the Big 12 conference bowl situation is a lot better. And long-term thinking, it will be very interesting to see what the bowls tie-ins for the Big 12 become once Texas and Oklahoma leave. After, I believe, the bowl agreements reset in 2025, do they still maintain the Sugar Bowl? Do they still maintain some of these higher-end bowl games that have been around for decades? Do they maintain those, or do those get lost? That's going to be something that's important. I think long-term thinking for the Big 12 Conference, the new commissioner, whenever those people step into their roles. I teased it earlier. Kalani Satake, BYU head football coach, joins the program now. And Kalani is entering his seventh year with the BYU football program. Seven years. It's crazy how time is just flying by. So, Kalani, what's been the biggest change from year one in 2016 to now, year seven at your alma mater? What's the biggest change in your BYU football program for you as the head coach at your alma mater? A lot older and... um I don't know. I, I think a lot of uh, uncertainty went into um, the first year. I, I felt like you're ready when you're getting your first head job, you know, and I compared it to being a father for the first time. You can study all you want and, and talk to as many people and think that you're ready. You can babysit as much as you want, but you have to just kind of go through the uh, the the process. And, and um, now going into it, it's like, okay, there's some things that I thought I was ready for and there's some things that I did not expect. And um, now that we're going into the seventh year, I feel really comfortable with it. I felt comfortable along the way, but I've been really excited about the opportunity to learn and get better and to just be in this role, you know. So I'm very thankful to be here and very thankful to that I uh, get the coach at, at my alma mater and that I get the coach at the place I grew up cheering for. So, um, you know, I, I can kind of connect with the fans in that aspect that I was a fan before I was a coach and before I was a player. So, Hopefully that uh that buys me a little bit of credibility in the job that I'm doing. <laughs> do, do you ever notice, Kalani, the similar career arc between you and Lavelle through the first six years where really good success at year one, maybe a little bit of a dip in year two, and then it took off around year five and year six for, for Lavelle, similar for you and what this program is now becoming. Uh, I mean, do, do you ever notice that, just kind of the, the parallels between you and, and your ultimate mentor? Well, it's just like uh, everyone that does, everyone that brings it up, it, it, it's, it's, they're the ones that make the parallel to me. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Well, uh, um, I even talked to Patty and, and she kind of mentioned that a little bit. And uh, I just hope that, uh, I mean, he had what, 29 years here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can do that, but I, 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 I want to give it a shot. I, I'm focused on year seven, but the, uh, I don't know. I, I felt like uh, being in this position, uh, I am I am here because of other people's hard work and sacrifice and mentoring and Lavelle is one of them. So I, if I can do anything that uh, that is similar to him, and, and and I know that he's he's like up on the pedestal for me, right? And so if there's anything I can do to to um, be close to like him and then, then my heroes, then then I I think I'll be okay. So hopefully that that it's worked well for me so far, but. I'll just keep trying to be like him as much as I can and, and be like the other mentors that have taught me and and um, keep trusting the young men on our team to, to get things done and uh, keep relying on a wonderful fan base to, to support us the entire time. Back-to-back 10-win -back seasons, and then you look forward to 2022 and you have some of the most returning production and some of the most uh, returning starters in all of college football from last year's team. How do you plan on on balancing getting the team ready in fall camp versus maybe – holding back a little bit because they're they're proven as you get ready for South Florida. 
Well, I think there's a good balance. I think we have to kind of play it by ear and, and and see how we're going. I mean, I don't think you can kind of make this statement now. I think as we go through it, we know the things that we need to accomplish, but at the same time, we have to we have to find a way to be at our best. And so, what is what does that mean? And and it can't be one way for everyone. There's 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 so many different um, there's so many different personalities and different levels of of readiness on our team. So. Uh, we have to be able to accommodate all of it. And, then, and the one thing that I'm really excited about going into this year is that we've added extra resources and extra personnel to help that um, accommodate uh, all the uh, all the different variety of young men that we have on our team and, and different levels of maturity, different levels of development. And so with that being said, I think we'll be in a really good spot um, considering we're returning a bunch of um, production. But Every year it's a ch- different challenge. Last year was like, hey, what's what are you gonna do to replace Zach and and all the the guys are leaving, you know, Dax and everyone else. Like, oh, well, I think we have a like, good idea. Um, and I think I mentioned saying, well, we just don't know a lot of the names. They're not really, they're not they're not the known ones yet. And now here we are a year later. It's like, okay, Puka Nakua is a, a name that you need to know about, and and now Blake Freeland is someone that a lot of people weren't talking about last year. Now people can't stop talking about him, right? And, that's just two. There's there's a bunch of them that are out there, and so my question is to to for for everyone is that there's a few here that people don't know about, and they they will know about it by the time we get to the end of the year, and that's the fun part about it. For me, it's just trying to find innovative and creative ways to get our team to keep um to keep pr- progressing towards where I think we can be and or where our players know we can get. Before fall camp kicks off on on August third, what area on this team do you feel is the most ready and maybe what p- aspect of the roster and the, and the position maybe keep you up the most at night? What, what, uh, what can you say to that? Um, I, I would say and I've, I've answered this a bunch of different ways, right? And I think the, to say the most ready right now is it's, it's kind of hard to do. Uh, I feel like even if you're a deep team and deep returning a bunch of your starters, um, you, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And so, uh, the the goal is just to be at your best, and it didn't, doesn't matter if you're a starter returning or a guy that's trying to be a starter. What I like is that if we can get guys to to pro, um, progress towards competing for starting spots. I mean, everybody's saying that Jaron's going to be a starting quarterback, but what if Jacob Conover makes this huge uh, um, stride of improvement and and gets better in the next couple months? Then then that creates competition for Jaron. But nobody's more competitive on Jaron than himself. So, so we have a bunch of those guys on our team that, uh, that are competitive with what they were already and where they want to be to the guy that's trying to get their spot. And so when you're full with uh, a team full of competition at all different angles, you should get the best result right there. So I don't know what keeps me up and I, except for everything. Right. But at the same time, I, I love what I'm doing. So it's not like it's all, it's like, Oh, it's so hard. Is it, that that that's the worst thing. That's such a lie to me. If, if I were to do that, I it, it's it's um I love doing this, so it's not it doesn't feel like work, and I get paid to do it. And and I I mean, imagine it, you guys being the head coach, you'd feel the same way. So I grew up a big BYU fan. I, that's all I'd cheer for when I was little, right? And then I get to play for the legendary Lavelle Edwards. And then I get to be the head coach. <laughs> so you can imagine that um, any moment I can talk media day, it was like, oh, how's it going for you? I was like, it's awesome. I love talking about BYU football. I love talking about our players. I love being um, in a position where all the attention is going to our guys. It's not necessarily about me, the attention, but I, I love just the, the subject of BYU football. And so uh, trying to ball up all that energy and excitement and then saying, hey, we got to wait till August. I was like, oh, all right. But media day means that it's right around the corner. So I'm, I'm really excited for it. What's impressed you about Jaron Hall? It could be on the field, could be off the field since the end of last season, how he's developed. Yeah, he, his leadership skills are unbelievable. He's always been a great leader. And uh, sometimes guys, can, we have a, a, a group of great young men that can lead. It's just giving them that opportunity, right? So uh, you can be a great leader. I think Jacob Connor was a great leader. Look what he did at Chandler. I think that we have a lot of players that are on depth on the depth for us that are great leaders. But for some reason, when you're given the opportunity to be the guy, now is your moment to really start to to when people are actually listening, where they where they're uh, the the spotlight's on you now. And 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 I've been really proud of the way he's been able to lead. And 
Uh, he, he's a much better for leader for us on the field when he's playing. And so that's the goal is to try to get, keep him in a position where he's going to be healthy and that he can keep leading this team, leading this offense. And when he, we do that, we feel like we're going to be able to score more points. One final thing for you, Kalani, before we let you go, I want to go back to, to Lavelle. Uh, you know, I, I know that all the focus for you is, is on this final independent season and it's going to be a, quite the battle uh, week one against South Florida. I've been telling Matt, it was like, don't sleep on this South Florida team. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, what What do you think, though, Lavelle would maybe think right now of, of BYU football is going to be a power five program? All the all the work that BYU has done to, uh, I mean, just when he took over in 72 to build it to where what it's become. And now that you guys are knocking on the door of being in a power five conference, just, I mean, hmm. do you ever kind of ponder and think like, what, what do you think he's thinking right now? That looking looking down. Uh, I think he he'd be really proud of of uh, where the program's going, and 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 I mean this he's the father of BYU football, so I know that his family's really proud. No, Patty is, and I know that his grandchildren are. Because I speak to them, I text them, and we keep a com- communication with his kids, and so he he is. Uh, but we would not be going to the Big Twelve without Lavelle. In other words, we wouldn't be doing that without guys like Jim McMahon, Steve Young all the great fans and the players from the past and the coaches, everyone that's been through the program, that just doesn't happen without them. And so now that we're going into the Big 12, we still need them all. That that in combination with the fans that have just been unbelievable, um, we are, we're are we all fans. That's why we're here, right? So the what a great man to follow is, is the leader of the, our football team, and Lavelle Edwards. I got to play for him. So... Uh, I think he'd be really proud. Of in fact, the, going into this year, it was really cool because we had Andy Reid talk to the team when he came and did our spring clinic. And um, you know, he was just giving some insight and some thoughts. And I I swear that it was Lavelle Edwards speaking to us, you know, and it's just things that I thought Lavelle would have said. And the one thing that stood out the most to me was to uh, avoid distractions. And I think that the, the Big 12 thing is really fun and exciting. Once we get it kind of, it's it's out there. So I, I felt like here we are, we're pronouncing, everybody knows that we're going to the Big 12, but um, we're going to get this thing focused on the thing that matters the most, and that's 2022, and getting it focused, focused on these seniors who will not be playing in the Big 12, making sure that they feel that they get all the attention and all the respect that they deserve and, and making sure that we're focused on this year and giving them all my energy and my effort. I think it's okay that we're acknowledging all that other stuff with the Big 12, but um, we're going to have to come right back and do what Andy Reid said and avoid the distractions now and focus on what matters right now, the task at hand, which is going into this team and this season. And when we do that, then we'll start to see this team become a lot more razor sharp in what they're trying to accomplish. You you can kind of see it in the – you have this this feeling when you're talking to the players, you can see it in our coaches, that there's a there's a different sense in them than that, that's been in the past, right? And um, I, I'm – I, I see it as this razor sharp focus that that uh that I've been experiencing as a head coach watching for watching and evaluating them. I'm really excited. So here we go, man. Like let's get this thing done and let's get the next couple months out of the way and get to this game as soon as we can. Well said. Let's uh, end it there. We appreciate the time as always, Kalani, and uh, wish you nothing but the best this season. Thanks, guys. Go Cougs. There you go. That's BYU head football coach Kalani Satake here on the Cougar Tracks podcast. And that'll do it for today's edition of Cougar Tracks here on this Monday, June 27th. 68 days till BYU football kicks it off against the South Florida Bulls. It's going to be here before we know it, folks. And we'll keep you covered all throughout the offseason and leading up to the 2022 BYU football season and in the season here on Cougar Tracks. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, at high noon mountain time and on the podcast on all major podcasting platforms. Talk to you on Wednesday here on Cougar Tracks. It's always powered by kslsports.com.